Words at War. It was at four o'clock on the afternoon of April 8th, 1942, that General Wainwright called me to his headquarters in the tunnel of Corregidor. Eh? Hey? Oh, oh yes, yes, Colonel Romano, I sent for you. He was sitting at a table. He wore no tie and his collar was open. It was hot, hot and humid. Yet General Wainwright's haggard face looked as cold as stone. He pushed back a pile of reports and stood up. Romano, once before, when you had a chance to leave, I asked you to stay on here. Now I'm ordering you to leave Corregidor. What do you mean? I beg pardon, General Wainwright, sir, but if I may ask, why? General MacArthur wants you with him in Australia. There's no further point to your remaining here. Batan, Batan is hopeless, Colonel. Hopeless. By the utter lack of expression on his face, I knew he was a man who had gone beyond emotion. I knew that he wept for his boys on Batan. I started to say something about not wanting to go, but he put his hand up to silence me. At seven tonight, take the little launch to Batan. Go to the airfield. From there, you will take off to Mindanao. We will report to General Roxas and... Where you will report to General Roxas and General Sharp. Here are your secret orders. He was abrupt and official. I felt dashed. I couldn't find anything to say, but... Goodbye, sir. Wait, Colonel. Colonel Robinu, when you get to Australia, tell President Kizan and General MacArthur... I'll do my best to the end. I will, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye, Colonel. God bless you. Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, brings you another radio adaptation of an important war book, Mother America, by Colonel Carlos P. Romulo. The, tonight's dramatization is presented in honor of Bill of Rights Week. Colonel Carlos P. Romulo, the Filipino editor who became aide to General Douglas MacArthur at the outbreak of the war in the Pacific, was the last man to leave Baton. On that day that shall live in infamy, that Sunday morning of December 7th, 1941, when Jap planes roared over Pearl Harbor, a new era in the relations between the East and the West began, even as the first bombs fell. The lives of hundreds of millions were changed as surely as those bombs burst. The lives of John Doe, the white man, of Huan Tao, the Filipino, of John Chung, the common man of the Orient. Their reactions varied. John Doe, the white man, rose in righteous wrath. Try those sneaking devils. We'll wipe them off the map. Talk in peace at the very minute they were bombing Pearl Harbor. John Chung in Burma, the Malay Peninsula, Thailand, the Indies. John Chung shrugged his shoulders as the invaders stormed his homeland. Does it really make so much difference? I have never had anything. If I have nothing under the invader, what will uh, I have a lot? But Juan Tao, the Filipino, had very definite opinions. I will fight. I will fight to the very end. I will fight by the side of the Americans, under the American flag. I will not surrender. And Juan Tao, the Filipino, did fight. At Luzon, Batan, and Corregidor. Fought when the odds were hopeless fought and starved through a living hell, fought and prayed for help to come, fought on when he knew there would be no help. The Jap plane swooped low and dropped leaflets, promising safe conduct through the lines and back to his home if Juan Tao would lay down his arms and quit. Why die for the white man, the Jap leaflet said. Come over to us, your fellow Orientals. But Juan Tao ripped the leaflets to shreds gnawed at his daily ration of rat and mule and fought unto the death by the side of the white man, by the side of the Americans, under the American flag. 
And why? Why did Juan Tao, the Filipino, alone of millions of Orientals who faced the Jap invasion, choose to fight and die? The answer is simple. Juan Tao, common man of the Philippines, had something to fight and die for. John Chiang, common man of the Orient, had questions for this Juan Tao, the Filipino who fought so fiercely. You, you, you tell me, Juan Tao, is it true that you Filipinos, fellow Orientals like ourselves, have a right to govern yourselves under white governments? See, si, that is so. It's true, too, that you have a right to vote in the Philippines. Uh, has it actually happened that in your, your country... White men have been punished, some even by death for crimes against the natives? See, si, it's true. Oh, you, you are paid uh, fair wages uh, like white men, and you, you, you own a food raised on your own land. You can send your children to public school and even uh, colleges built by Americans? Well, of course. Uh, also, I have heard you may attend the social affairs given by American. He visit you in your home and, and you and his as his friends. Oh, that, of course, is absurd. No, it's not absurd. That is true. Oh, no, it's difficult to believe. But but one another thing. It said also that if you do not like some point in American law, you can send objection all the way to America and will be listened to with respect. Uh, could uh, this be possible? It is possible, John Chung. That is the way things are with us in the Philippines. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, no, no wonder then, uh, one Tao, you fight so fiercely. Oh, I, I would fight for such things. But we have even more, John Chung. We Filipinos have the promise of freedom, complete independence. Not just a vague promise for some time in the future, no. A day has been set for it. See, you are right. I have something worth fighting for, John Chung. Yes, on December 9th, 1941, when Jap planes roared down on Manila, Juan Tao, the common man, made his decision. He fought for America, Mother America. He had something to fight for. But it wasn't always like that, was it, Juan Tao? No, it was not always like that. Even 50 years ago, it was not like that. Then the Filipinos were serfs to the rich Spanish landlords. You own no land at all, Juan Tao? No. Under the system, I would be employed to farm a certain piece of land. The landlord would advance me a sum of money for seed and farming tools. This I was to repay out of the rice I produced. Wasn't it generous of the landlord to advance you money? No. Because crops were uncertain, it became impossible to repay the loan. It would grow from year to year. And children would be born and grow up saddled with a debt perhaps a hundred years old. But couldn't the young people see that this was unfair? How would they see that? Well, the young people would go to school and learn that such things were unfair. No. There were no schools for Filipinos. Learning was considered to be a dangerous thing for natives. The Filipino had no advantages? Very few. There was no justice worthy of the name. Men would be accused and tried in secret. Then they would just vanish. No one knew where. And in the end, Juan Tao? In the end, naturally, we revolted. Yes, in the end, Juan Tao revolted against exploitation, greed, and the utter poverty that had been his lot. But his fight for freedom was interrupted by the Spanish-American War. And out of this war came America to take over the Philippines. Was that better, Juan Tao? We did not think it was better. Not at first. We resented America as violently as we had resented Spain. Why? We had little reason to think well of the white man in the Orient. Besides, we had built a framework in our own minds for our own democracy. We resented what we believed to be America's opposition to our freedom. What did you do? We fought the Americans in guerrilla warfare. We hated them as foreign devils. Even the children scowled at American soldiers and refused to speak to them. America called our resistance insurrection. We prefer to call it our second revolution. Where are your leaders hiding? Speak up! Answer me! I give you this one last chance. 
All right, give him the water cure. Perhaps he'll talk then. Take him away. All right, you next. Where's your ammunition hidden? I do not know. You do know? Now, perhaps you'd like the rope cure? I do not know where the ammunition is hidden. Very well. Perhaps you'll be able to remember. Take him away. The rope cure and the water cure tortures are the dark ages. It must have embittered you, Juan Tao. Not any more than we were already. We were not surprised. This, we said to each other, is what one must expect from the white man. But then... Then the strange thing happened. What strange thing happened, Juan Tao? From Washington, D.C., the capital of America, came orders for an investigation. Officers of the army were tried. Some fined. Some dismissed from the army. Some sent to prison. But that was only right, Juan Tao. See, si, right. But we had not been accustomed to right and justice. We could not believe it, that the nation that we had been fighting as a tyrant should take such pains to uncover and punish tyranny by its own soldiers. Such things deeply impressed Juan Tao, common man of the Philippines. He could not cast aside all his prejudices overnight, but slowly American military leaders began to win his confidence. And one of the first to win wholehearted trust from Juan Tao was General Arthur MacArthur, the father of General Douglas MacArthur, hero of Bataan and Corregidor. The elder MacArthur granted amnesty to all who had laid down their arms. He established the writ of habeas corpus, foundation of the Bill of Rights, a daring act in a country still at war. And when the guerrilla leader Emilio Aguinaldo was captured, General Arthur MacArthur met him with the respect one military leader tenders another. And the result was Aguinaldo's proclamation. The Philippines have declared unmistakably for peace by acknowledging and accepting the sovereignty of the United States throughout the entire archipelago, as I do now without any reservations whatsoever, I believe that I am serving my beloved country. But what of the people? What of the common man, Juan Tao? I could not quit so easily. It is true that our armed resistance against America had come to an end. But I had fought too long and too bitterly to yield in spirit. I was impressed with some things America had done, but still I was not altogether convinced of her friendly intentions. In my own mind and heart, in my own way, I continued my fight for freedom. But as time went by, other strange things occurred. What kind of strange things were these, Juan Tao? Well... When an injustice occurred, we took the matter to the American authorities. It was an astonishing thing. We were listened to with respect. Slowly, the Americans were winning the confidence of Juan Tao. There was the case of an American who charged outrageous interest. He was arrested by Filipino police, tried before a Filipino judge, convicted and imprisoned in a Filipino jail with Filipino guards. There were a few lawyers who took advantage of their Filipino clients. They were caught at it and disbarred, just as they would have been at home in the United States. The great soldier General Arthur MacArthur appeared before a Senate committee to testify in behalf of the Filipinos. Such consideration of subject peoples had never been shown in the entire history of colonization. All this was not lost upon John Chang, Wan Tao's fellow Oriental. I, is it true, Wan Tao, that roads have been built by Americans for your use? Si, it is so. I have heard, too, there are schools for children. Si. And uh, systems of uh, sanitation have been installed and uh, harbors built. Si, there have been many improvements. Oh, so. Oh. Uh, then you, you, you are now content, Wan Tao? No. I am not content. Oh, no. So, well, what, what more do you ask? I ask for what I shall always ask, John Chong. I shall always ask for independence.
Yes, Huan Tao clung to his dream of freedom, although he was the first to admit that life had become better for him since the coming of the Americans. Not only roads and primary schools, but high schools. And even universities were now open to the child of Huan Tao, the common man. Hospitals were built, and disease which had ravaged the people vanished in proportion. And gradually, more and more political advantages were placed in Filipino hands. In 1907, elections were held for the assembly. The first Philippine legislature met. 100,000 votes had been cast by Filipinos. But equally important were the little things that contributed to mutual understanding and respect. See, the little things were important to us. For instance, a national holiday was set aside by the Americans in honor of the great Filipino hero, Rizal, who had been executed as a rebel under the Spanish rule. That impressed you, didn't it, Juan Tao? Si, it did. For Rizal was dear to all of us. He had been ordered shot by the Spaniards and forced to stand with his back to the firing squad so that he would be shot in the back. But at the very last instant, he whirled and faced the rifles, died facing them. He made a victory out of death. See, si, Rizal was important to us. And the other little things, Juan Tao? Some were so small you would think them of no consequence. But here is another. The American Governor General Henry L. Stimson, see, now the Secretary of War, gave orders that for all receptions given at the Governor's Palace, the invitations were to be divided equally between Filipinos and Americans. A small thing, surely. See, and then Governor Stimson ordered that all official balls at the palace should open with the Philippine dance Rigadon de Honor. And the governor and his wife themselves learned the dance so that they might take part. A pleasant thing, but what did it mean to you, Wan Tao? You, the common man. It meant much. This little thing and all the others. They meant much to all Filipinos. We were not being despised as an inferior race. We were being accepted as equals and partners. We were being given dignity. And to us, and to all our fellow Orientals, there is nothing more important. Yes, that was the important thing. In the beginning, America groped in the Philippines, groped and stumbled and made mistakes. But for all the groping and stumbling, America never forgot that paramount element the dignity of the human soul. But Juan Tao wanted more. He wanted his independence. Freedom was a dream he would never put aside. He had fought Spain for freedom, then America. Now, under benevolent American rule, he began his third fight for freedom. And fairly enough, Juan Tao's leaders were men who had been schooled in America, Filipinos who had studied in American universities, and had come home again to base the Philippine claim for independence on the very principle of democracy they had learned in America. Two Filipino leaders emerged who were to carry the fight for independence on to final victory. One, Sergio Osmena, laid the foundation for independence at home in the Philippines. The other carried the fight into Washington, the capital of America. He was Manuel El Quezon, later to become president of the Philippines. He is the acknowledged leader of the Filipino people. He stands today as the symbol of Philippine redemption. But still, there was a long fight ahead. American sentiment generally was with us. But there were some Americans with investments in the Philippines who said... The government ought to protect our interests out here. Other countries take care of their businessmen in the colony. But to the eternal credit of America, the government was not concerned with protecting business interests in the Philippines. The American businessman was on his own. And then there were others who opposed us, but sincerely. I am all for giving the Filipinos their independence. But let's face the facts. They're not ready for it. They're better off the way they are now. 
We could never believe that. The burning love of freedom was too strong within us. We had come to respect and to love America, but freedom, that was our goal. In 1916, the Jones Act was passed by Congress, putting legislative power entirely in Filipino hands and carrying with it for the first time a promise of freedom backed by the authority of the United States Congress. But our efforts were not rewarded. Each year, the municipal councils in the Philippines passed resolutions calling for independence. Manuel Quezon presented these demands to the American people. He established a press bureau in Washington to tell the truth about the Philippines. He even published a magazine called The Filipino People. All these efforts, led by Manuel L. Quezon, at last made the dream of all Filipinos come true. A scratch of a pen in the hands of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt one day in 1935, putting his signature to the Tidings McDuffie Act, ended the long struggle. Philippine independence was definitely promised for the year 1946. Juan Tao had won his fight for freedom. It had taken just 42 years, 42 years for a people who had nothing to start with but a burning love of freedom to achieve that freedom. Juan Tao, the common man of the Philippines, just 42 years ago, lived in poverty. His children were ill-fed, were denied the advantages of education. His towns and cities were disease-ridden, and yet hopeless as his lot seemed to be, he did not abandon his dream of freedom, and he found a sympathetic and a sincere friend in Mother America. Forty-two years. In forty-two years, Mother America led the Filipino nation to the point where it was ready to fight to death in defense of democracy. Just forty-two years. Something for us to remember when we are tempted to say of other subject peoples, they are not yet prepared. How are they to be prepared? How are the hundreds of millions of the East and West to come to an understanding? Well, let's go back to the common men. John Chong of the Orient, Wan Tao of the Philippines, John Doe, the white man. Uh, you first, John Chang. I, uh, I find it hard to understand John Doe, the white man. He comes to the Orient. He seems to do no work. He pays no taxes. He seems to drink exceedingly. He lives in places to which I am denied admission on. And yet he grows rich, rich, very rich. In a land where I must work all day, work all day, seven days a week in rain and sunshine to earn two dollars a week. And now you, John Doe. Trouble with John Chung is he's not progressive. He's not a go-getter. No push to him. Does he really want freedom? Isn't he better off with me looking after him? What if John Chung were given self-government? He'd probably be more wretched and miserable than he is right now. And now what do you say, Juan Tao, common man of the Philippines? I have something to say to both. For I know both John Chang, the Oriental, and John Doe, the white man. Let me talk first to John Doe. John Doe, you must come to understand John Chang better. You consider him evasive and given to subterfuge. He is not that way with his own people. He has no reason to mistrust them as he has you. John Chang is not mysterious as you seem to believe, John Doe. His simple precepts of behavior are centuries old. You are annoyed because he is not a go-getter. John Chang believes haste to be an indignity. He does not race against time because he knows that time will beat him in the end. The constant hurry chop-chop of the white man is an affront to him. So too is your superior attitude your way of talking down to him, an affront to the soul of John Chung. 
These are the kind of things that have turned John Chung against you, John Doe. And what do you say to John Chung, Guan Tao of the Philippines? Just this. Keep your dream of freedom. We kept ours, and in just 42 years, we who had nothing to begin with, made that dream come true with the guidance of Mother America. Make our pattern your pattern, John Chung. Yes, that is the pattern that holds the only hope of peace and progress in the Pacific. The pattern of democracy that brought independence to the Philippines. This pattern will be one for the world to work by if peace is to be achieved throughout the world. The essence of our world struggle is that all men shall be free. The Atlantic Charter laid down the premise of that world freedom, binding its signatories to respect the rights of all people to choose the form of government under which they will live. The merits of this principle were proven by America in the Philippines. Through that example, we know that educational advantages, fair dealing, goodwill, and the infiltration of the principles of democracy will end war. We have seen millions die and countries deformed in this war. We have learned that there are no economic or spiritual wastes so great as those made by war. We know, or we should know by now, that to create peace, we must devote to it the same energy and enthusiasm and industry we have shown in our preparations for war. This war, to be justifiable, must mean freedom for John Chang as well as John Doe. Freedom for John Chang to believe in his own gods, to tend his own bit of land, to believe in the genius of his people in lifting their heads above the dust. It is John Chang and John Doe who are fighting. It is for them that this war must be won. heard another program in the series Words at War. Tonight, passages from Mother America by Colonel Carlos P. Romulo, distinguished Filipino editor and personal aide to General MacArthur. The radio adaptation of Mother America was by Gerald Holland. The cast included Roger DeCoven as Colonel Carlos Romulo, Jackson Beck, Alan Devitt, Julian Noah, Joe DeSantis, and Bernard Lenro. The original music was by William H. Meader, the production was directed by Frank Pat. Next week, Words at War will bring you an adaptation of Log Book by Frank Laskier, a vivid story of the British Merchant Marine. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. This broadcast of Mother America has been given in the spirit of Bill of Rights Week, now being celebrated by the New York Journal American and other newspapers throughout the country. This is the National Broadcasting Company.